is not quite in the right place. Do you want to change that, or is that? Oh, I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, one o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and start. And I'm introducing myself. Again, if you came in from the beginning, I'm Ray Smith, the Ford Specialist at UK at the Lexington campus. And my goal is to talk about managing grazing systems with novel in the fight fescue. But I'm also going to talk about managing stands that you already have that have Kentucky 31. Uh, because um, most of you, even if you're going to plant novel in the fight, aren't going to convert the farm over 100% tomorrow. Um, and many times you have steep hillsides, things like that, that Kentucky 31 existing stands may be the best thing there. And we'll talk about how to manage that better. Um, if someone could take the lights down, um, Jimmy, the, if you don't mind. Okay, so I'm just going to jump into it. I've got a fair bit to cover in the next 45 minutes, and I want to make sure that we are on time with going out to the field and looking at some plots there. Um, now, it is a little bit chilly, but we won't be a lot of time out there actually in the field, but you'll get a good tour um, on the buses as we move out. Okay, so I'll talk about novel paddocks, toxic paddocks, meaning Kentucky 31, and then managing the novel and the toxic in a system. And, and I apologize that we're throwing out a lot of different terms that kind of mean the same thing, um, but part of that's intentional because you're going to hear different terms. You hear us talking about the novel endophyte. Um, we ought, sometimes we will use the term friendly endophyte or beneficial endophyte. All of those fit together. Uh, and, and the word non-toxic fits as well, though something that would be endophyte free, not having any endophyte in that, could also fit into that non-toxic category. So just bear with us if it seems a bit confusing, um, and, and hopefully as we move through these presentations, it'll make sense by the end. And like I say, the last publication in your book um, does a great job of explaining these concepts. So just as Craig showed you at the beginning, the the toxic Kentucky 31 fescue has these five these um, um the filaments of the fungi growing in between the plant cells. So it was really a pretty easy process when they realized that, uh, like Daryl Franson mentioned, discovered it back in the 70s, what was causing the problem, because you can store the seed, give a particular heat treatment, um, and get rid of the fungus and you have endophyte free. So there's many endophyte free varieties available. And they're not bad varieties. Um, I like to tell people the survival is similar that you would have with orchard grass. Um, so you're just talking about in Kentucky environment, a replanting every four or five years. Um, so that's why we think that the extra price for the novel, or the beneficial endophyte that survive, the stands survive much longer, makes sense. Um, and just some of the terms that I mentioned before. Okay, let me first talk about managing novel um, paddocks. And a lot of what I'll talk about is, like I say, maybe you take 25% of your farm and you plant a novel endophyte, and then, and then what do you do with that? How do you manage that? Now, any forage, uh, you're going to manage it a certain way. Alfalfa, you're managing typically for quality hay and for stand longevity. You're not going to go and cut alfalfa every three weeks because you're going to thin that stand out in just one year. If you planted annual Lespedeza to have some good summer production, um, you're going to manage it to reseed because it's an annual. You've got to make sure that you let it go to seed um, in late August, September each year. With the novels, your main management is for persistence. Um, we, we've mentioned today the benefits of animal gain, and those are great. But don't do like we did at our Woodford County farm. Uh, and, and we replanted a stand of one of the novels, uh, but the, the farm crew continued to manage that like Kentucky 31 with pretty much continuous grazing, and it just survived about three years. It's, it's, it doesn't work that way. You've, you've got to manage it better because without the animals, you know, kind of on Kentucky 31, they're not feeling very well. They've got a high temperature. They're not grazing as much, so they don't graze it as hard, but they will graze these hard. Uh, what causes pastures to die out? Abi abiotic stresses, what I mean by that are things like drought. 
hot temperatures, uh, winter kill, water logging, um, soil fertility. All of those would fit into abiotic stresses, and those can be limitations on any pasture stand. Uh, then you've got biotic stresses, things like insects, pathogens, diseases, um, allelopathy from other plants that affect their growth, overgrazing. So fescue is a, is a very, fescue as a plant itself is a real good survivor. Um, but two things that are really make it hard, so you've planted a novel endophyte fescue, two things that are going to be hard on that stand is if you try to scrimp on the soil fertility, because you want to keep those plants in, in a good healthy state. And so, you know, it's fairly simple. Soil test, uh, put your line, put your fertilizer as it's called for, um, but that's all the more essential um, when you're planting the novel endophyte fescue. Um, and overgrazing is the other one. And as I mentioned just a minute ago, um, a plant that's not making an animal sick, that's a great thing. But if you've got too many stock there, you leave them too long, they're going to graze into the ground. And that's going to be hard on any plant. Um, now let me give just a couple of reminders. We've, we've, we've given some of these slides several times, but, but I think it's worth a, a little refresher. These are some of these symptoms that you have with... Um, Kentucky 31 or toxic fescue, vasoconstriction, and that's in any livestock class. Um, Karen, her work is using ultrasound and, and is measured in horses, the vasoconstriction happening. Um, fescue foot, thermoregulation happening because of that uh, vasoconstriction. They're not able to dissipate heat as well. Um, fat necrosis, you saw some pictures of that. Production standpoint, low feed intake, low rate of gain. Low birth weight, weaning weight, dystocia, birthing problems, poor reproduction, agalacia, poor milk production. Um, these, these last two are, are, are some of the, the real major issues that you have in, in mares. And um, pregnant mares are even more sensitive um, to ergovaline, to the toxins in Kentucky 31 tall fescue, even than cattle. So um, Jimmy Klotz, um, Jimmy, where are you at? Right here. He did some really neat work a few years ago, and I don't know whether you developed it, but I think you did, of this dissection method, um, taking out a vein from an animal that's being slaughtered and cutting it in little donuts and then putting that um, in a solution in whatever solution you want to, but he was putting different solutions of these alkaloids um, and looking at the vasoconstriction, because it's still, as long as you took it right away, it's still a live muscle, and you look at the difference between the bottom one and the top one. In fact, he's even got the, the measurements in uh, millimeters, I guess, Jimmy, uh, of the constriction. So this is what we're talking about. You know, we're talking about kind of like, we say constriction, it's kind of like um, when you've got arteriosclerosis and, and you don't get as much blood going through your vessels. We're talking about the same thing, but fortunately, this is something that they recover from, once they get off the, the toxic fescue. Um, here again is a picture of the um, uh, fungus in between the plant cells. So Nick's gone through this already. Um, the, the fungal strands in the bottom of the plant, but they grow up through the plant into the seed. Fortunately, um, Kentucky 31 and other continental type fes tall fescues with, that have a toxic endophyte do not have as much of the endophyte and the resulting toxins in the leaves as they do in the stem and it, as in the seed head. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, you saw this curve earlier. It varies a little bit, but, it, but in short, the levels tend to be lower in the winter, up in the spring when the seed heads are going up, um, down in the midsummer, back up again in the fall, and a lot of it is when the plant's growing in a strong capacity, then it's got the ability to produce these secondary compounds like the alkaloids, um, and that's, that's where you see the issue. Now, in Kentucky, the data that we've done on some local horse farms and cattle farms, usually from mid-December through end of March, even early April, the levels tend to be down at, at very low levels, below even the levels that would be an issue for a pregnant mare. Um, and we often get a dip in the summer, though not always, um, but, but we can, 
consistently get a spike in the spring and then um, often in the fall, sometimes quite high in the fall, sometimes not as high. Um, the exception to this was last winter. You know, we didn't really get cold weather till early March last winter. And so the fescue continued to grow. And so even though we didn't have huge levels, they were still up in the three to 400 parts per billion that we could have some issues. And a few farms um, grazing cattle, and we had some reports from veterinarians on horse farms that there were some issues that you wouldn't normally see in January or February uh, because normally the fescue has stopped growing. It's just kind of sitting there stockpiled. Um, we didn't see that same thing this winter with the cold weather that we had earlier. Okay, let me go back into okay, management, specific management. And I'm going to talk, how do you manage your existing stands of Kentucky 31 tall fescue? How do you manage it so they're not as much of an issue? Now, you've seen this a couple of times, this chart. So it's nice to do an endophyte test. Most stands do have a high level of infection, but we've looked at over a thousand um, horse pastures, and we'll find probably 10 to 20 percent of the time where they'll we could call them a low infection range, or at least low enough that there's not as much of an issue. So that might be a stand that you would keep. Um, but when there you got a high level of infection, meaning a lot of the plants have the endophyte. Then you decide to replace, you decide to manage. So I'm going to be talking about management. Now you're going to hear a lot of things, and you, if you've read any literature over the years, you've probably heard a lot of things about how to take care of animals grazing fescue. Um, some people have said you breed it this way, you don't, you don't breed this, you feed this particular compound, you don't feed uh, or feed that compound, you can use spices and mineral mixtures and uh, all kind of things. Pet milk, um, you can chase cattle around. I don't know quite where that comes from because you think about an animal that's under heat stress and you chase it around and you increase its body temperature even more. Jimmy, I think we've had some real problems with a couple of animals that just from moving them up to weigh them and stuff at the research farm. So that's the last thing you want to do. Now there is a mineral compound that has high levels of, or has levels of capsaicin like in hot peppers, and that is a vasodilator. You know, that's kind of why you're sweating when you're eating hot peppers. Um, and, and so in theory that works, but we don't have much data that I know of. Jimmy, you don't know of much data that's actually measured that. Um, so, yeah. Um, so we're, we're, our goal at the end of the day is for you to have foolproof solutions, um, not having to go um, plant your garden in hot peppers and feed that to your animals. Okay, so I'm going to talk about alkaloid management and incremental alleviation. And I'm going to go through eight different practices. Um, we talked about testing. Um, Nick did a great job in talking about that. Um, his company, Agronostics, does this testing. Um, the UK regulatory services will test, actually they're, they're using Nick's kits, but you can send samples to them through your county agent um, or send them there directly just like you send in soil samples. Our veterinary diagnostic lab also tests for levels of ergovaline, um, so quite straightforward test there. Or you could, you could um, go to Nick's website and actually mail it directly to him. Um, so in talking about alkaloid management, I'm going to try to cover all of these things, but, but in a systematic way. Okay, what about animals in Kentucky that have been grazing on Kentucky 31 tall fescue? You know, maybe there was a, a spring calving animal and, and they, your calf comes out and you take it through the summer and into the early fall and then you sell it, you send it to the feed yard. Um, now, this picture is actually um, where it's all wet there. The animals are getting the water to come out and kind of make a little bit of a, a pond that they can wallow in even in the feed yard, to cool themselves off. They're also urinating more um, because they're drinking more water to try to cool themselves off. Now the next slide, what this is showing is both sets of animals, well actually um, we had three sets of animals here. This is Susan Duckett's work in, in uh, Clemson. And so the bottom one is animals that were coming off um, E+, plus, meaning um, Kentucky 31 toxic fescue. Okay, and they were starting here about 700 pounds. And then we had animals that were coming off E minus, that's endophyte free, 
And then E++ stands for the novel endophyte fescue. So they were coming in here about a little better than 800 pounds. And both of them gained weight. In fact, they gained weight in a very linear fashion. But the ones coming off the toxic fescue, there, there wasn't a compensatory effect. They didn't, they didn't bump up here um, into the level of growth that you were having or into the, the actual um, pounds per annum of growth that you had coming off the endophyte free or the novel endophyte. Um, so we saw a residual effect. The animals were not as thrifty um, even during the time that they were in the feed yard. Okay, when I talk about incremental alleviation, okay, what I'm talking about is if here's the E+, plus, here's Kentucky 31, if that's the level of gain that you've got with just grass, and you add legumes, you add clover. We've often talked about that in different meetings, and that is a very good way to alleviate some of the toxicity, um, both with the effect of dilution, they just not, they're not eating as much, and some other benefits I'll mention in a second. Um, you can add a supplement. Um, I'll give one slide on that in a minute. Uh, there's different supplements that can be used. Um, rotational grazing. Rotational grazing, you're, doing, you're managing what the animals are eating, not just them eating anything they want to. Um, you have a better chance of keeping the plant in a leafy stage. Remember, the leaves have less toxin than the stem and the seed heads. So particularly in the spring of the year, keeping it leafy um, by mowing or by hard grazing or other factors. Um, so in, in theory, all of, if you do all of these things really well, you've increased gain. But if you plant a novel endophyte fescue, then you have had the same increase in gain, and in, in most cases probably been a little bit better, because you're not having to do a balancing act with all of these. So you can dilute the field. Uh, you, could, you could plant a tall fescue that's not infected. You could plant smooth brome grass, orchard grass, red clover. Smooth brome's not going to do so well in Kentucky, but that would be something that might fit in Missouri. Um, red clover, white clover, bird's foot tree full. Anything that you're diluting, even if you're just putting hay out there, is going to be a dilution factor. They're not going to get as much ergovalin in their system. Um, some really neat work that's been done through Michael Flythe and Jimmy, you've been involved, and several people at the USDA lab have, have been in, in, involved there in Lexington. And so this is a picture of an actual ultrasound, and it's showing the vasoconstriction that has happened. Um, the vessel is quite small uh, with an animal grazing toxic tall fescue, Kentucky 31 tall fescue, that vasoconstriction. Over here, an animal that's being fed about a, the equivalent of a one-third ration of red clover, um, there's isoflavones or metabolites in that um, red clover. Um, the main one that's identified um, that's a beneficial from a vasorelaxant standpoint is biocanon A. So what we're saying is that red clover has compounds that actually have a medicinal effect, a vasorelaxer. And I won't go into, I can show you several other slides with this and USDA lab here is, is doing the groundbreaking work on this whole area. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's like giving a pill to an animal. You know, if, if you've got a heart condition and your vessels are constricted, and you could take some of the compounds that would have a similar effect to relax your vessels. Um, I mean, the limitation is exactly how much red clover do you need. Um, we know that red clover through the season isn't going to have the same level of biocanon A, so we're still learning a lot. Um, but in tests in the laboratory, in tests that they've taken to the field, both with cattle and goats, um, they've shown this vasorelaxant um, category. So not only is red clover diluting the amount of toxic pesky they're eating, it's also um, counteracting that vasoconstriction. Um, white clover would have some of the same type of compounds, but in lower amounts. Jimmy's probably the best way to put it. Yeah. Okay, you could feed a supplement. Um, here's a control. Um, in this particular study, the average daily gain was about 1.4 with grazing um, the toxic Kentucky 31 tall fescue, feeding three pounds a day of corn, feeding corn gluten. I um, got a little bit better when you fed the six pounds um, of corn gluten. So that, again, you're diluting, and not just diluting how much fescue they're eating, but you've got some quite nutritious feed, so the animal is in better health, the, the rumen function is in better health. Um, here's some work that, that Glenn Aiken um, did several years ago, and he was feeding soybean hulls and or um, estradiol ear implants. And so right here, 
was the toxic tall fescue. They were gaining about 1.6 pounds per day. When they added an ear implant, they got 13% higher gain. When they added the soybean hulls, um, this was at, a, um, I think the standard rate that Glenn used was a 0.75% of body weight, um, at least with some of the other studies. I think that was what he used here. He got a 31% increase. I'm going to use both the ear implants and the soybean hulls. He got a 70% increase from 1.6 up to 2.7. Now, you know, don't, don't say, well, that's all I need to do if I can get that kind of gain. You're not always going to get that results, but that's another way of, of ameliorating the effects on, of toxic fescue. Uh, rotate to summer pasture. You add sedan grass or sorghum sedan grass, other warm seasons, you get a bump on the toxic fescue. Um, you plant an E minus, um, so endophyte free or a novel endophyte, you get an even further bump. And if you if you incorporate the summer annuals into that, you'd get even the further bump. So again, it, it helps to be doing things to ameliorate or to dilute, um, but if you start with a novel um, or endophyte free, then you get even a greater benefit. Limit nitrogen. In the 50s and 60s, before they knew anything about an endophyte in a plant, they were seeing animal problems. And one of the places that they were seeing some of the most severe problems was on um, fields in the southern U.S. where they, a lot of poultry litter had been applied to. So actually some of the early theories is that poultry litter was causing animals to get sick. But it was just that the poultry litter was helping the fescue grow so much better that it had plenty of extra energy to produce these secondary compounds enough that it made animals sick. Um, so high nitrogen is associated with toxicosis. Um, in, in a simple study here by um, Rotting House um, back, you know, a good while ago, when he looked at the leaf ergovaline, the amount of ergovaline in leaf material, we had no nitrogen, 258. It, it bumped up to 306 with 60 pounds of nitrogen. And Craig, if Craig's close by, was that, I'm assuming that was a spring nitrogen application in this study? So spring nitrogen application, I'm um, 120, the leaf ergovaline was 485. And when you start getting up into this, particularly the 400s, you're starting to see some effects on animals. Um, with horses, we talk about, with pregnant mares, we don't want to be seeing over 200 parts per billion. Um, so you think about it, you apply nitrogen in the spring, you're getting good growth, but you're also getting even better stem and seed head growth, and that's where you've got um, the biggest issues. As you can see right here, the stem and the sheath, we saw levels with that 120 pounds of nitrogen up to 1,000 parts per billion. And the seed head itself went from a level that's a concern, 895, up to 1,500 with that application of nitrogen. So we're not saying don't ever put nitrogen on fescue. You are going to get um, better hay production. Um, but we're saying, you know, be careful with the levels, particularly if it's, if it's on a pasture. Um, clip seed heads. If you mow the seed heads off, if they're not there, um, then you've automatically um, reduced the overall toxicity the animal's getting. Um, this was a study over several locations, um, published, um, the main author was Rogers, um, but a number of collaborators, and they were mowing once a month down to two inches, just an existing stand of Kentucky 31, and the levels of ergovaline in April were down in the levels that, you know, you consider, you know, pretty well a safe range. Um, and all the states were, were lower. Um, May, they, they crept up, crept up in June. But normally, with a normal growth pattern and the plants putting up um, stems and seed heads, you see the big spike here. And we've seen on some of the horse farms that are mowing at six or seven inches. So you're not taking it down close. You're not really stressing the plant that much. Um, even though we, we're taking the seed heads off, we still often see um, a, a spike here in the spring. So continued through the summer, um, once a month mowing in September and October, um, the levels were higher. The plant wasn't under as much stress, and so even though it had been mowed back closely, those good growing conditions in the fall, um, we had levels that definitely get up into a concern. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, this is the kind of material that you're stockpiling. You, do, you know, you don't, we talk about very good nutrition in stockpiled fescue, but if you can leave that material uh, November into December, then you get, see the drop in um, ergovaline. You can ammoniate hay. Uh, 
Um, not that complicated a process. You cover um, the round bales or, or square bales for that matter with heavy plastic. You bury the edge. Um, you take an anhydrous tank and you um, put a pipe underneath here and squirt that in. Um, that um, helps, can act as a preservative for the hay, can, can increase the, um, not the actual protein, but the effective protein, but that can also reduce the ergovalene. But now we don't recommend this very much because anhydrous ammonia is a toxic chemical and you've got to really know what you're doing to be messing with it or you'll be blinded or, or um, actually die from it. So um, where a lot of anhydrous is used and where anhydrous is commonly used to treat things like wheat straw, um, this would be more of an option. Uh, we don't really see it fitting very much in Kentucky. Partly the danger, partly we don't have a lot of anhydrous ammonia. Um, you could simply make hay and reduce the amount of ergovalene. So material here that was cut and measured directly, green chop was just the green fresh material like an animal would be consuming. Um, this would have been a, a, um, in the spring when we had some seed heads, 1,200, 1,300 parts per billion. Um, in sile, it, it dropped slightly, um, though that was a little bit uh, questionable data. But with hay, it dropped down to uh, 450 parts per billion. Typically, we see about a drop of about a half in ergovalene between the fresh material in the field, and then it sits out and it sits in the sunlight and it goes through a drying process and some of the ergovalene dissipates. Ergovalene is actually not that stable a compound, um, but when, plant, when animals are getting it fresh, then they're getting a dose directly. So it, it, it'd be easy to say, we well, just make hay, but often we're making hay on material that's got um, stems and seed heads, and so even if you take it from 12, 1300 down to 600, um, you could still have issues with winter feeding. If you're seeing any kind of issues on your animals with winter feeding, um, and you're feeding them mainly hay, and you're starting to see frostbite and other things, um, then it could well be the, the alkaloids in the hay. Gray stockpiled late. I've already mentioned that a couple of times. Um, so just wait until you have, you've had those hard freezes. So deferred grazing. And then we, we mentioned a couple of times chaparral. So let me take a, a few minutes to go through some slides. I'm Tommy Yankee, the county agent Anderson County right over here. has done a lot of work with this. Um, Glenn Aiken um, did some of the very first studies on farms. In fact, probably some of you collaborated with, with Glenn and, and Tommy and others. So it's a herbicide. But one of the compounds in that herbicide is, is metsulfuron. Um, sold now, used to be, uh, is it, used to be Cimarron, now it's Ally or vice versa. <laughs> um, so one of the compounds in Chaparral um, is, that, is that product that actually will stunt or almost eliminate seed heads. If you spray it at a certain time, you suppress fescue seed heads. We're talking kind of late April is a good time period um, in Kentucky. Proved rate of gain, weaning weight, pregnancy. You know, why is it doing all these things? Now, part of it is seed heads are not as high a quality as leaves. But we also, um, the, probably the bigger effect from the research that's been done is the fact that if you don't have the ergovalene in the stem and the seed head, um, you, you've really improved um, the, the quality um, or the gain potential of the fescue. It's a quite a good herbicide. So, to spray chaparral just to suppress seed heads, I'm not sure if that makes sense. But to spray it in a field that you've got some weed issues and you also get the added advantage of suppressing the seed heads. Or Bob, like you mentioned, you maybe you're going to use it to suppress seed heads to make it a little bit easier when you're going to renovate that field later in the year. Um, but I definitely wouldn't recommend that someone spray in chaparral every year to suppress seed heads. First of all, they, they kill the clover and they're never going to get cl clover back in there again. Uh, but, but it is a useful tool, and you'll see some of the, that in some of the data. Animals eat seed heads because there's a high carbohydrate content. So when they go into a field, if it's at a seed head stage, and this is a video that is not going to um, work and play on this computer, um, but they're actually going through the field. They've just been turning, and they're eating individual seed heads that may be 1,500, 2,000 parts per billion. So side by side here, Gramoxone Next um, is a good herbicide, used to be called um, Forefront. Um, two weeks after application, you see a good weed control. Chaparral, two weeks after application, you see a good weed control. 
So it was sprayed. This is picture was May 15th, so it was sprayed early May in Missouri by Scott Flynn with, with Dow. Okay, you look June 16th, look at the seed heads where Grazon Nex was sprayed. Grazon Nex is a good herbicide, but doesn't have any suppression of seed heads. Very few seed heads over here where the chaparral was sprayed. Um, here's the difference in the way the animals look. Um, an untreated animal with a continuing to have a rough hair coat, um, here's the chaparral treated. Now let me summarize this with a slide that Dr. Aiken put together. So the upper south, the recommendation is to spray chaparral from mid-April until the boot stage, until that seed head is just elongating, usually the first or second week of May. Um, rotationally stocked seed head suppressed fescue. This not only suppresses the seed heads, but it does weaken the fescue plant. And so you could actually damage your stand um, by spraying chaparral. Now, if you're going to be converting that stand to a novel, you may want to kind of knock back the um, Kentucky 31. Um, but if you don't want to thin out the fescue, then you need to make sure that you're treating it a little bit better. Um, one reason that we say to wait till late April, early May, um, you're going to knock back all the seed heads, not just some of them, and an early spray, again, can damage the fescue. Um, don't spray chaparral if you want to keep clover. It's a very effective broadleaf herbicide. Again, we mentioned earlier, you're talking about having to wait to the following winter to, to reseed clover into this um, pasture. Um, we've got a couple of contacts here, Brad Mettler uh, with, with Dow that you could be in contact with. If you want more detailed information, Scott Flynn, um, who did his graduate work here at University of Kentucky, um, um, very good researcher now with Dow. Okay, again, going back to that testing, do you have an issue? If it's high, what do you do? Um, I'm going to spend the next little bit talking about management, or talking more about management. Here's the review of what we've just mentioned. Okay, let's talk about managing a system where you've got not just novel, not just toxic, but you've got both of those. How much non-toxic forage is needed? When should it be used? How do you manage the forage deficit during the transition? If you take this paddock out of production, but you're, you're stocking kind of at full capacity, you know, how do you get enough feed for the animals during that period of time? Um, now, interesting study, and, and Jeff showed some of this information. Um, this, this work was, some of it was done in Tennessee. I know some was done in Arkansas. So the suggestion is that if you could take and remove cows from toxic Kentucky 31 fescue for 30 days before and after breeding, you'd see no effect on pregnancy rates. Um, the actual research was done at University of Arkansas. So they took a farm that had 25% of the area renovated in non-toxic fescue, the novel in the fight, 75% um, toxic, and they compared that to a farm that had not been renovated. So 100% was toxic fescue. Cow-calf pairs grazed the non-toxic beginning 30 days before the start of the breeding season until forage availability was limiting. Until they, in essence, had grazed it down too close, um, you're going to start hurting the stands. And that took them into the first three to four weeks of the breeding season. So here's the results. Again, um, Jeff showed you some of this work. With 100% toxic fescue, where they, the cows never came off of that, their calving rate was 44%. Where they had them that 30 days before the start of the breeding season um, on the novel fescue, um, they had an 80% calving rate. 100% novel was an 80% calving rate. So that break during that period of time, during that 30 days before, three to four weeks after breeding started, um, made a tremendous difference. Not so much in, in calving interval and in birth weight, but in actually number of calves that they had. Um, fall and spring calving. One of the real advantages to fall calving is you're breeding when the fescue is not toxic. Um, you're breeding there, you know, in the winter time or late fall. Calving rate, even with 100% toxic fescue in the fall, again, work there in Arkansas, uh, was 96% calving rate. Um, that spring calving on the 100% toxic was 44, 
um, the 100% novel was 80. So fall calving is a simple solution to overcoming some of the issues. Um, but, um, yeah. So summarizing this in a, tab or in a table form or figure form, um, just over 40 with the toxic 100%. Um, the novel, whether it was 100% or you just had 25% to use during the breeding season, um, you had that 80% conception. And the difference here in spring and fall calving. Okay, how much is needed? So partial renovation helped a good bit. Even though that 25% that was novel didn't cover the whole breeding season, um, it still made a big difference. Um, com complete renovation resulted in reduced calving interval and increased weaning weight, calf average daily gain and calf value versus just a 25%. I didn't actually take the time to show that on the table, but you do get other benefits from complete renovation, but don't say, well, I can't do it because I can't do my whole farm. Um, just a portion can be a, a big benefit. When should non-toxic fescue be used? Um, advantages in the hay supply. For sure advantages with spring calving cows. Um, if you've got fall-born calves and once they're weaned, you've got a, a high-quality feed with spring stalkers. Um, during the early part of the stockpile period, uh, when the level of ergovalene can be up quite high there in October, November, uh, before you get those hard freezes. So a lot of what we're talking about, a lot of what we're encouraging you to think about is managing the risk that you have on your farm. Um, renovate where you think you'll have the most immediate benefit. Um, renovate on the land that's maybe not, you know, the side of a hillside. Renovate land that you've got pretty good fertility already. Uh, you're going to see a, a benefit. You'll get a good stand there. You'll have good production. Annually convert what you're comfortable with. Uh, don't leave here today and say, this is what I need to do, because you heard us talking about it. Make sure it makes sense to you. Uh, maximize forage production. Um, the use from those renovated acres, um, seeded and non-toxic and adjust your typical grazing patterns. Um, so Jimmy talked about this with establishment. Um, if you decide that you do want to renovate, then you, you'll have a spring flush of toxic fescue. You could cut it for hay, you could graze it heavily, you want to make sure it doesn't go to seed, you might as well go ahead and use it. Um, summer annuals can be planted, then you have grazing, um, hay, baleage out of those. Um, you could do that just um, two or three sprays like Jimmy talked about, but, but you lose that summer production. Um, and then decide, you know, if you, particularly if you put in a summer annual, do you really have a deficit in forage production? Or are you just having to kind of change what you're doing a bit? Or maybe even does it make sense to plant a cash crop? Um, and, and, and Jimmy mentioned this, but I want to... Definitely reiterate it. If you've gone to all the trouble and you've spent the $200 an acre or so um, to plant a novel fescue, then it's not, just, um, it's not just what you're doing in the fall. You've seeded in the fall. You've got one to three tons possible yield for that first year. We, with some of our tests, our variety test data we'll talk about when we go out to the field, we've had even uh, more like three to four tons. Um, but the late spring or early summer after that fall seeding, a really good practice is to cut it for hay um, because you, your plants aren't that big then. Cutting for hay is not going to be as damaged to the stand as animals getting out there, particularly if you put them out there during a wet period. Um, so just use, maybe you do graze it, but be careful. Uh, make sure that you're not leaving them out there. Um, even that late summer fall, it takes about a full year for fescue to develop a sod. We know what kind of sod fescue can develop, but you need to give it time to develop. Because you're talking about, you're not planning just for a year or two, you're planning for something that's going to be in there um, 10 plus years. Um, limited opportunities the first year after seeding uh, for livestock to stand on the renovated area. Definitely don't use that area that you um, just spent all the effort to, to seed to novel fescue and use it uh, for feeding um, that fall or winter. Uh, full production and use is the following spring, so a little over a year after seeding. Um, a little bit more detailed data about grazing management, um, but the big point is just making sure that you don't overgraze. I um, mean, and, and again, as I said at the beginning, animals aren't feeling sick. They're not heat stressed. They don't have that increased body temperature. Um, they're hungry. They're going to have a higher intake. Um, so the normal stocking rate that you might have on Kentucky 31 
that could be hard on that novel pasture because they end up grazing it closer. Um, let me just move past that. And, and we'll, you'll hear more about specific varieties when the people from the different companies talk at the end of the day. So summary thoughts here. Carefully manage in, um, the harvest, whether it's grazing or hay, of newly renovated areas. Minimize contamination of newly renovated acres. So if you've gone to all the effort to see the novel fescue, then don't the next winter or even, even three years down the road feed hay on that area that comes from a Kentucky 31 pasture. Um, particularly if that pasture's got, you know, you let it, it's grown up or your neighbors let it grow up and you bought the hay and it's got Kentucky 31 seed in it. You don't want to recontaminate. You're not going to recontaminate just because a toxic field is next, next to a novel field. You're going to contaminate by reintroduction of seed or not doing a good job of controlling it in the first place. Um, seed head control of non-renovated toxic acres is critical because if animals come from a pasture and they're grazing seed heads of Kentucky 31, and then you move them next to that new novel field, it takes several days of passage, about three days on average, for the material they eat today to pass out in the manure. And even though a fair bit of fescue seed is digested, um, there's enough that comes out of the manure um, that you can recontaminate the field that way. Um, well, just make sure that they're not grazing Kentucky 31 with seed heads. So the, the idea would be just not to let any of your pastures um, go up and have seed heads. Yeah. I mean, and, and again, you're talking about, even if you do have seed heads, you're talking about a fairly limited time of the year. You're talking about in the month of June, kind of think strategically about how you're grazing. Maybe some fields you're not worried about mowing, but that field that's right next to the novel in the fight, then that one you're going to mow the seed heads, or that's the one that you're going to spray the chaparral on. Um, last two things I'll show you. We've got an updated forage website now, just at the last few months. If you Google KY forages, then you get to our updated website. We've tried to categorize things a little bit easier um, with these main tabs. Um, we've got um, a link to Forge News. We've also got upcoming events. And how many of you receive Forge News, our monthly newsletter? Okay, if you do not receive that, um, we work really hard to put timely information, both events but also um, research that's happening and, and good extension advice. And used to be you had to be a member of the Kentucky Forge and Grassland Council to receive that, but now we decided to make it freely available. So if you go to the Kentucky, you, you Google KY Forages, um, you go here to Forge News and just click here and you'll subscribe. Um, and that will allow you to um, get the monthly newsletter by email. Um, I'm my own timekeeper, and I did finish a minute and a half early, which usually I go over. Um, I don't keep myself very good. But any questions that you all got before we head out to the field? Yes, sir. Yes, 